Greetings, everyone. Today we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 11. John is told to measure the temple within and without, that the outer is given to the Gentiles, who will trample the holy city. God's two witnesses will have power and will prophesy 1260 days. If anyone tries to hurt them, they will be killed. These witnesses have power to stop the rain and bring plagues upon the earth. When their testimony is finished, the beast will kill them and leave their bodies in the street for three and a half days. After that they will rise into heaven for all to see. There will be a great earthquake and one-tenth of the city will fall. Seven thousand will die and the remnant will give glory to God. The second woe is past, and the third is coming. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of God. The elders praise and worship God Almighty. The nations are angry for the time of God's wrath is come. The temple of God is opened, and there is lightning, voices, thunder, an earthquake, and hail. Verse 1 reads as follows. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. What is the temple of God and the altar, and who are them that worship therein? This cannot refer to the temple in Jerusalem, as it was destroyed in 70 AD, 25 years before John wrote Revelation. Furthermore, Paul wrote, For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. And he also wrote, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. And Paul wrote to the Ephesians regarding the body of Christ. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And Stephen said, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Acts chapter 7, verses 48 and 49. Presumably John is not asked to measure a physical temple that was destroyed many years before this commandment was given him. Surely the prophecy does not pertain to a physical temple, but rather to one spiritual. Surely the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein refers to all believers in Jesus Christ. These constitute the body of Christ, which is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The text is careful not to use the term Jews, rather them that worship therein, meaning believers in Christ. Should the text have said Jews rather than them that worship, we might be more inclined to think the angel is speaking of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. However, the term worshippers denotes all who have faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 2 of Revelation chapter 11 reads as follows, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it was given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty and two months is three and a half years, or according to Scripture's numbering of prophetic years, twelve hundred and sixty years. That's three hundred and sixty times three point five. Thus unbelievers herein referred to as Gentiles will aggress on the church or body of Christ for twelve hundred and sixty years. This may apply to the Dark Ages a duration of approximately 1260 years when Antichrist, Papal Rome, slaughtered Christians until the Reformation wounded the beast 
and began to break the persecution. The holy city refers to spiritual Jerusalem, the heavenly city, wherein all the redeemed dwell with Christ. Verse 3 And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. The two witnesses does not refer to two individuals only, as the period of prophecy is 1260 days, which prophetically is meant 1260 years. Thus the text refers to those who hold the testimony of Christ, which is both Old and New Testaments for the duration of Antichrist's persecution. The two witnesses also represent the true Church of God, against which the gates of hell will not prevail. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Yet, despite persecution and poverty, God sustains at least a remnant of his church through the campaigns of Antichrist. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Olive trees bear fruit and candlesticks give light. Together they represent the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ manifest in the scriptures and in the church. They are the servants of God, standing before him, ready to do his bidding. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Out of the mouths of the witnesses proceed the word of God. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, and purified as silver in a fiery furnace, Psalm chapter 12 verse 6. Enemies of the gospel are consumed by it, for unto those who believe it is life, and to all others it is judgment and death. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. The days of their prophecy were 1260 years, when Antichrist's most aggressive campaign against the church was enacted. During that time, the prayers of the saints bring great trouble on Antichrist's kingdom. Their prayers to God for deliverance and vengeance do not go unanswered. God raised up the armies of Muhammad to decimate the eastern part of the Holy Roman Empire, Antichrist's kingdom, and devastating plagues spread throughout the known world, leprosy, bubonic plague, smallpox, tuberculosis, scabies, anthrax, trachoma, and sweating sickness, just to name a few. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. When they shall have finished their testimony does not mean the testimony of Christ comes to an end. Rather, the testimony of the body of Christ is brought to a head at the end of the 1260 years, meaning the power of Antichrist is broken by the word of God. Rome's efforts to suppress the gospel had been broken by a few brave men who dared publish Bibles in common languages. Most of these preachers of God's word were murdered by Antichrist, who raised up a religious military order, the Jesuits, to counter the Reformation. It was their job to stamp out Protestantism and bring disenfranchised sheep back into the fold of Mother Whore, Mystery, Babylon and the Roman Catholic Church. The beast that makes war with the saints is papal Rome. Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. John writes metaphorically of a city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. This being the great city of Rome, not Jerusalem per se, as it is never referred to as a great city. Yet there is some allusion to Jerusalem where Christ was physically crucified. However, the judgment and sentence passed on Christ was Roman and within the Roman province of Palestine, wherein is found Jerusalem. 
At the time John wrote Revelation, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the armies of Prince Titus Vespasian and could hardly be considered a great city. Rather, it was, at that time, a pathetic ruin, and remained thus until fairly recently. Verse 9. And they, the people, and kindreds, and tongues, and nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Antichrist was notorious for denying true Christians a proper burial, throwing them in ditches, exhuming them and burning their remains, and dumping them in rivers and lakes. Well-known Reformation scholar John Gill wrote, Yet it may have some reference to usage of the witnesses' enemies, who sometimes have not allowed them a burial. So the bodies of John Huss and Jerome of Prague were burnt, and their ashes cast into the Rhine. The body of Peter Ramus was cast about the streets, thrown into ponds and ditches, then dragged out and beat with rods, and some have had their bones dug up again, after they had been buried many years, and the burnt and their ashes scattered abroad, as Wycliffe and Bucer here in England. Of note also was Papal Rome's persecutions of Protestants in the valleys of Piedmont, where thousands were slaughtered, dispersed, and forbidden to practice their religion. This occurred from 1686 to 1690. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. They that dwell on the earth refers to non-believers. They are earthly while true believers dwell in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and chapter 2 verse 6. The earth dwellers celebrate because they no longer hear the convicting words of the prophets. Not that the prophets physically tormented them. Rather, constant preaching can be a torment to those who are perishing. Thus they rejoiced at the demise of the two prophets. Verse 11. And after three days and a half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Prophetically, three and a half days represents three and a half years. Antichrist may have for a time defeated true Christians, but it was short-lived, and from the residue of the martyrs rose a great response from true believers. Millions exited the Roman Catholic Church much to the dismay of the papacy. It seemed the persecutions and martyrs only inspired greater faith in Christ and a widespread turning away from mystery Babylon. Thus, there was a great rising up against Rome. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. This represents revival of the Christian faith by way of the Protestant Reformation. For there is no physical resurrection of believers until the second coming of Christ. Verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Upon Christian revival, There was a great military, religious, and political upheaval, and initially one-tenth of papal Rome fell. Within the tenth part were also slain seven thousand men, perhaps referring to leaders over hundreds or more. We cannot be sure. However, seven thousand seems a small number, respective of papal Rome's population of many millions at the time. Verse 14. The second woe is past, and behold, The third woe cometh quickly. This is in reference to the three woes mentioned in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. Now comes the third woe. Verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Great voices declare the kingdoms of the world are now the kingdoms of Jesus Christ, meaning that the true gospel has been preached throughout the entire world, that Rome's false gospel has been exposed, 
and diminished with the truth of Christ's redemption by faith. This was largely accomplished with the advent of the Protestant Reformation and its taking the true gospel to all corners of the earth. Verses 16 and 17 And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And so the twenty-four representatives of all who have faith in Messiah fell on their faces and worshipped God. For the gospel, having been preached in all the world, makes way for the resurrection and the second coming of Christ. The elders give thanks and praise God that this has come to pass, and God's great power is made evident. Verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. This references the great day of his wrath is come. Revelation chapter 6 verse 17. When the gospel is preached in all the world, and the Lord is about to return and reward the saints, then falls his wrath upon unbelievers. Unbelievers are those who reject Christ, deny him as the creator, and despise his creation, and having held deep contempt and hatred in their hearts, they sought to destroy all that God said was good. God is about to judge them. They know it, and they are angry. Verse 19 And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. The opening of the temple in heaven signifies that all will know who is the Lord God of heaven and earth, and the ark of his testament will be known by all. That indeed God is the Redeemer, and his word and salvation are complete in Christ Jesus by faith. And the body of Christ, which is made up of all the redeemed in Christ, will be seen by all. Thus the people of God will finally be made known, for they have received God's testament of salvation by faith in Messiah, and they are the temple of God. God bless. Thank you for listening.